Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm um, glad to see so many of you here for what I know is going to be a fascinating and fun conversation. I've been able to spend a little bit of time with our guests, Kathy Marr and Les Standiford in the green room and at a tech run earlier. And um, I think you're going to enjoy the way they chat with one another. And obviously, the content of the conversation is going to be fascinating. So sit back and enjoy. I'm Jennifer LaRue. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and I think we're going to hear a lot uh, to tonight, or a little bit anyway, about why the Mark Twain House would be hosting um, a, a book talk about this particular book. The eras are similar and many similar characters, uh, a lot of intertwining. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. Before we move on to our program, I'd just like to introduce you to a few features of Crowdcast, which is the platform we use for our virtual programming. We've been doing these ever since April of 2020, uh, and it seems incredible that we're still doing them, but they've been a lot of fun, and we're really grateful to our audiences for sticking with us and um, enjoying our programs with us as we've moved through this difficult time and now are emerging into what looks like might be a little bit better a time. So I see that some of you already have discovered the chat. That's awesome. Please continue continue to chat away. Uh, um, it's really part of what makes Crowdcast fun. Know that this program is being recorded and will be posted on our website, marktwainhouse.org, after, uh, after it's ended. Uh, and one fun thing is that the chat remains live. So if you make friends with somebody and want to continue the conversation, you can always come back and do that. Um, I also want to draw your attention while we're looking at the chat to the link that's at the very top that allows you to order your signed copy of Battle for the Big Top, which is the book we're discussing tonight. Now, we're no dummies at the Mark Twain House and Museum. We know that you have other options for buying this book, um, but please know that if you do make the purchase by following that link, uh, not only do you get a signed copy, which you don't get everywhere else, but uh, also know that your um, purchase benefits the Mark Twain House and Museum. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that right now. Right below my face is a green bar that says Birdies for Charity, adds 15% to your donation. Um, I'm really proud of my colleagues uh, and our board at the Mark Twain House. We've really worked hard through a very challenging time as so many nonprofits and, and cultural organizations have. Um, and it's been a struggle. We've been and remain furloughed one day a week as a staff. Um, and we really have uh, worked hard to keep the place afloat, and we're really proud of the fact that we have done so. But a lot of um, what we've been able to do has depended on the generosity of people like yourselves who are willing to click that button and donate whatever you are able to share with us. Um, Right now is a very good time to do that because uh, the Travelers uh, Golf Championships Birdies for Charity program adds 15% to whatever you are able to share with us, which really is a, a you know, that's a pretty substantial amount. So if you are able to, um, please know that every single penny is deeply appreciated by the board and staff of Mark Twain House, and we put every penny to very good use. So thank you in advance for that. So I'm not going to talk any longer other than to make a few introductions. Um, first of all, I do want to thank our sponsors. Uh, this program, like so many of our others, are uh, spons is sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation. And our media sponsor is Connecticut Public, WNPR. And this program is produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord. So about our guests, uh, with more than 30 years in the museum world, Kath Kathleen or Kathy Marr is a gifted speaker, as you're about to see, and noted authority on all things related to Phineas Taylor Barnum. Kathy joined the Barnum Museum in 1998 and has been executive director since 2005. And very notably, she saw the museum through a very challenging time when a tornado um, destroyed much of the building. And I, I don't know if we'll talk about that tonight or not, but I do want you to know that she has walked the walk. Uh, We'll, Kathy will be talking with Les Standiford, the author of several, several critically acclaimed books, including Last Train to Paradise, Meet You in Hell, and Bringing Adam Home. His book, The Man Who Invented Christmas, was a New York Times editor's choice and was made into a feature film starring Christopher Plummer, the late Christopher Plummer and Dan Stevens in 2018. He's a professor of English and founding director of the creative writing program at Florida International University and holds an MA and PhD in literature and creative writing from the University of Utah. 
Um, he attended the U.S. Air Force Academy and Columbia School of Law and is a former screenwriting fellow and graduate of the American Film Institute in Los Angeles. He joins us from Miami, Florida, and now I'm feeling very daunted by him having just read his resume. So everyone, please join me in welcoming to the screen Kathy Marr and Les Standerford, and just be there with me while I bring them up. Whoopsie daisy. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but hi, Kathy and Les, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Hi. I'm looking forward to hearing you chat. Great to be here. Uh -oh. Okay, well, that just started happening. Has something changed with anybody's um, setup there? That sounds like somebody has Crowdcast open on more than one tab or more than one device. Um, no. Are you getting that feedback with me? No. No. Plus, could you say another word, please? Yep. I'm going to toggle off your mic while you figure out what you can close down. So, Kathy, while we give Les a moment, and will you please um, uh, confirm for me that that was not going on just moments ago in the green room? Okay. Nope. I was not getting it. And you're hearing me okay? Testing? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Fantastic. So... You know, it can. Be I can. It, it, before you know, I can do some of this. So without less there, so this way he won't feel embarrassed. I'm okay. going to encourage everybody to click on and purchase this book through the Twain House. It's it's a remarkable institution, and every dollar counts. We all know that now. I'm speaking as that museum person. So this is just a wonderful opportunity uh, to support the Mark Twain House Museum and to buy this book and enrich yourself with a story that's not typically uh, discussed. At the Mark Twain hallowed halls. So we're <laughs> excited about that. Well, thank you so much. Unless before I sign off, can you try again, just say a word or two? I would just add to what Kathy was saying, that Christmas is <laughs> coming sooner than you think. <laughs> All right, then. On that word, on that note, I'm going to uh, duck out and I'll be back to help with the Q&A. And I'm so sorry. I went to mention that. Um, if you have questions for, for Les or Kathy, please put them down at the bottom of the screen in the ask a question area rather than in the chat. That'll make it a lot easier for us when it comes time for the Q&A. Um, and now I'm going to leave. Thank <laughs> Thanks you. so much, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we got that little tech glitch out. This is going to yeah. run perfectly now. Right. Here we are. Yeah. So here we are. So before before we get into the core of everything, first of all, it's been an absolute joy to get to know you. And, and I look forward to a long relationship because, uh, again, I'll plug the book. This was wonderful um, and enlightened me to a lot of um, things that I didn't necessarily know. And we'll talk about that as, as we get on. So to be the host of a program like this gives me special privileges. I got to read the book early and I got to resonate on it um, you know, before tonight. So that was a, a true gift. But um, again, it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, you told me a little story about a week or so ago that I, I thought we should just absolutely um, give your wife, Kimberly, a shout out, first of all, because if it wasn't for her, and you could tell the story a little bit, you might not have gotten to the place of actually writing, uh, you know, going on the journey of the story. That's that's true, Kathy. And before I get into it, uh, just let me say that the feeling is mutual. You know, sometimes uh, you do interviews for books and uh, you might be marched down onto a television set and the host uh, looks up and you can tell by the blank look that they don't know who you are or really <laughs> why you're there. <laughs> until somebody puts the script in front of them and it's you have to in those uh, uh circumstances you conduct your own interview it's uh one of the most frightening things that a writer can go through but we're not going to have that problem uh, yeah, I don't think so. anyway uh back to kimberly i had give i was giving a talk at the ritz carlton hotel about another book uh before a group of insurance executives i'm pretty sure it was in 2015 and and came downstairs. My wife was in the lobby because she'd heard me a thousand times and not one more time was she going to put up with it. And uh, <laughs> she'd been walking around the beautiful grounds of this hotel and she said, there's something you've got to see. And I looked at my watch and uh, I said, but I've already called the car up. We've got to get to the next thing. And she said, you have to see this very calmly. 
And I said, okay, and I could tell she was uh, adamant and out we went onto these grounds and she took me down to a plaque uh, that was a fixed uh, pedestal there. And uh, on the plaque, it said words to the effect that uh, nearly a hundred years ago on these, uh, near these grounds, uh, John Ringling intended to erect a Ritz Carlton hotel but the Great Depression and other factors intervened and it took until almost the, the beginning of the 21st century for that to take place and here it is. And it stopped me because I had never heard, uh, was aware of no action that John Ringling had taken that wasn't beneath a canvas tent uh, in one of three rings. And I, I began to look into it that, that he really was the, founder for all intents and purposes of the modern city of, of Sarasota, uh, was a major developer and had had his hands in railroading and oil and all this stuff fueled by the fortune that he'd made as a circus man. I knew none of this. Mm -hmm. I began to immediately, uh, I began to tug on that, that unraveled, unraveling sleeve of history's uh, sweater and found one thing after another that ultimately convinced me this was a story that really deserved to be told. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, I, I couldn't, couldn't not tell. Yeah. It, and it, it, it's fascinating. Anybody who's not been down to Sarasota, it's, it's certainly worth a trip because um, his, his home, he, he and uh, Mabel built Carazan and it is open to the public and they were huge collectors of Italian art. It's, it's a journey worth taking. So he you're became, right. He became one of the principal art, uh, had one of the principal uh, private art collections of Renaissance art uh, in all the world. And that's mm -hmm. still on display. He built a museum there. There's a circus museum and then there's the home, uh, all of this making up the Ringling Museum. And I have, I'm a little ashamed to say, knew almost nothing about this before I began to do the research. So, and, and I share that because when I came to the Barnum in 1998, now I'm from New York, I did not nearly know anything about P.T. Barnum and he is the author of New York City Entertainment, you know, and it just blew my mind. It's like, how, how could I not have grown up with somebody teaching this. So it, it was a similar journey. Well, uh, a quote I ran across at the time of Barnum's death, Louis Cronenberger yeah. wrote in his obit of P.T. Barnum that with the exception of Karl Marx and Sigmund mm -hmm. Freud, no uh, American has impacted more lives than P.T. Barnum. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that's not a line that causes you to say, Hmm. Let me look into that. I don't know what. Yeah, it's absolutely it's absolutely true. So, so your approach to the book um, is interesting, and you tell us right in the very beginning that um, y your approach was not historical archaeology in a sense. This is more of a love letter to the story, to the human journey, and uh, that I just found that to be lovely, and it made me think differently. Well, I, I say at the end of that opening chapter where uh, I attended the last uh, performance of the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus, that it struck me that here, uh, what I had come to realize, the two of the most able uh, men in Gilded Age, American Gilded Age history, had devoted their lives to an, the institution of the circus. And they were certainly capable individuals who could have done many other things, became successful wildly beyond uh, the dreams of most of us through the circus and had devoted their lives to the circus. And I thought, for heaven's sakes, uh, I, I worried that the circus, particularly with it about to close, was, mm -hmm. was going to be dismissed uh, to the dustbin of, of history forever. And I thought, no, 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 no. There's more to it than that, folks. And that's yeah. why I wanted to write the book. Yeah, so that, that's wonderful, too. And um, and I, we grew up differently, too. I mean, I saw my first circus in the 1970s actually at Nassau Coliseum. Uh, so it was somewhat poetic to, uh, to see the last show. But you were at the very last show. I was at the afternoon show. Um, you know, so just, just out of curiosity, how did that, how did that 
touch you at that? Because you had already, where were you in writing the book at that moment? Oh, I'd done a, a mountain of research. And mm -hmm. so I understood a few things about the circus. And I walked out of there that night. It was a beautiful uh, early summer mm -hmm. evening. And the uh, place was still alive with uh, uh, souvenir sellers hawking uh, candy mm -hmm. and programs and whatnot. And, and people, many of whom had dressed up in costumes of their you know, uh, <laughs> favorite performers were wandering around and talking to each other as if they'd known each other all their lives. And maybe some of them had. And I, I just thought, uh, I turned to Kimberly and I said, you know, this is the first night in how many nights, in how many years for a number of these people that they're not rushing off to catch a plane or a train or get into a car and drive to the next event. This is the end of an era for so many people who had just, who had just created this uh, amazing thing, this uh, uh, where you kept turning to one another and say, did I just see that? Did that really happen? Is that, is that humanly possible? And mm -hmm. it all come to an end like that. And, uh, I, that was particularly, uh, poignant. Mm -hmm. No, no, no if CGI I, in the circus. I would, I would finish up this project. Right. And, and you grew up in a small town in Ohio. You said that when the circus, it's like the old fashioned, everything shut down. People didn't even have TVs. Well, you know, there was a time, uh, and particularly in, in places like Cambridge, Ohio, where I grew up, uh, that the arrival of the circus in town marked the advent of the fourth major holiday after the 4th of July and Thanksgiving and Christmas was the day the circus came to town. That's the only other time when everything else stopped. The banks were closed. Schools were let out. Businesses mm -hmm. closed. And the whole populace gathered on Main Street to watch the parade uh, uh, make its way toward the, the circus grounds. And there would be a matinee performance. And uh, then there would be an evening performance. And some people, if they could afford it, went to both. Uh, and it was a magical, a magical time because most of the, and it wasn't just uh, back in the uh, days when I was growing up, but through the, the history of this country, most of the people who attended the circus spent most of their days and weeks trying to make a living, trying to get by, working very hard in places where there was uh, relatively little by way of mass or public entertainment. And so when along comes the circus and they walk in there and they see these incredible things happening, it's a reminder of the whole of the American dream in the first place. This is a country where anything can happen. And they would go in and see three hours worth of proof of that. Look at that, would you? Yeah, and just, just mesmerizing. Absolutely. And just mesmerizing. I was and at the time, even though my the circus I was attending in Cambridge was not the Barnum and Bailey uh, <laughs> combined show. So, you know, uh, so they didn't roll through. But um, but so this is kind of an emotional journey for you as well uh, when you think about it. And, and you tell a couple of stories um, in the book, too, that just kind of made me step back because I didn't know about the field fire. So like you were saying, how these shows just broke down and set up in the next town. It, it was a machine. It just didn't stop. And the, the one, um, the one troop was caught in that blaze and had to outrun, figure out how to outrun a massive they, fire. They got very good at moving vast amounts of machinery and men and uh, animals and yeah. material from place to place so much so that the German army is said to have sent emissaries over to consult uh, with the ringlings to, you know, just how do you do it? Uh, because they thought it might be helpful to their war effort. And, uh, but it wasn't always that way. In the early days, the, the mud shows, they were called because they were traveling on dirt roads that turned to mud with every rain, traveled in wagons, pulled by teams, horse teams. And uh, one of them uh, was, uh, on one of them was at the time an assistant a man named W.C. Coop, and he wrote about his experiences. They were, it was a fine morning, and they were headed across the Kansas Prairie toward the next stop, and someone took a look and said, what's that smoke? What are those clouds behind us? And, and they, uh, a more experienced fellow took a look and realized it was not clouds. It was smoke 
from a prairie fire and it clearly was advancing upon them. And they, they had just a few miles to try to make it to a river up ahead that hopefully would break the fire. But it soon became evident that with elephants and horses and, and all that, they weren't going to make it. And uh, a fellow uh, traveling with the squad called, called everybody to a stop, ran around with a can of kerosene, poured a circle of kerosene around, lit it on fire, and burned up about a 12-foot ring around them. When the fire came to that ring, it magically sort of parted and went on. And just about everyone survived that time. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, and um, it might as well have been a chapter from a thriller novel. When I read it in Coop's diary, it was uh, one of story after story after story that made me think. You know, that what goes on in the ring is fascinating enough, but some of the stories, many of the stories that went on outside the ring, mm -hmm. were just as fascinating. Yeah, and and two, I think a lot of folks uh, might not know that a, a traveling circus was is its own community. It traveled with its clergy, it traveled with teacher, it traveled with everybody uh, in a bond. So these people were fighting for their family survival. Absolutely. You know? uh, 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 Kenneth Feld, who took over from his father, Irwin, who bought out the Ringling, uh, bought out the operation, ran the circus for the last 50 years, said that it uh, likened it to a town with its own little zip code. They had teachers, they have a commissary. Yep. Uh, they have a machine shop. They have uh, the uh, animals. Yeah. They have the people. Uh, it, all of it. And for the most, except in rare instances, they would play New York for a week, uh, Chicago, uh, perhaps for a week or a few days. But most of it was day, even later on, day after day after day, you'd take that whole uh, thousand person enterprise mm -hmm. and move it from city to city in time for a matinee and an evening performance. It, I mean, it, it is logistics, and I've been I've been studying this for a long time, and it still, you know, baffles my imagination. And then even knowing some people who actually took, um, you know, took on the greatest show until the end, uh, a few friends that it is just it's heartwarming and just staggering to think um, about my community getting in a train and. <laughs> going to the next town. It's just almost unfathomable, unfathomable. But um, to to the one thing that we, we talked about too, which I, I did want to bring up, and it's relevant really to to this audience that we have here, seeing how, you know, the Twain House is Nook Farm in, in Hartford. I think, not to talk about more tragedies, but certainly Circus had one of its greatest um, tragedies in Hartford um, with the fire. And the last time I actually hosted a Twain program on site uh, was to um, talk about that book. There might be some survivors or, you know, relatives of survivors on this, um, on this uh, crowdcast right now. So certainly a nod to all of you. But if you want to talk a little bit, and you said you might even just read a little bit, um, no, no spoilers on, on the book, <laughs> but um, uh, no, of course not. But it might give. Uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about how I do that. I try to do these uh, kinds of books. Uh, if I read just a little passage from that, the the great book about the Hartford Circus Fire is by Stuart Onan, and that's the title of it: The Great uh, the Hartford Circus Fire. Uh, I'm indebted to him for so much of what I have found out about that. But uh, let me just read a couple paragraphs that that might give you the uh, sense of it. The it's an event that ter of terrible tragedy and uh, uh, and still memorialized in Hartford on a on a regular basis. Photographer Dick Miller just finished snapping the last shots of the clowns disappearing down the chute from Clown Alley when he turned and saw the flames running from the sidewall up a guy rope toward the top of the tent. Fire! He cried, and Detective John Reardon and scores of others were soon echoing the call, the Walendas sliding down lines not yet burning toward the chaos on the ground. Fanned by a breeze out of the storm-laden west, the flames advanced at a speed that astonished witnesses. Three ushers ran through the main entrance carrying buckets to fight the fire, but the instant they were inside, the intense heat set their, fire, their hair afire and their clothing smoldering. They were forced to retreat, using the water they carried to douse themselves. One roustabout told a reporter, it was like you'd opened hell's doors. 
you had all you could do to get your hands over your face and run the other way. Circus director Fred Bradna, the man whom Titan John Ringling himself had fought to install, his hair burned away as he pulled more than a dozen trapped children from the mass near the animal chute, stared in disbelief at the smoke and dust palled ruin about him. Bodies piled four and five deep, the animals still screeching and wailing. It seemed impossible. The worst circus fire in all history. Far more Hartford lives lost than lost in the assault on Normandy. Started and finished in less than 15 minutes. Yeah, I mean, that that's, pow that's powerful. That, you know, that's powerful. And that still is so embedded in, in Hartford's history alone. And, um, and like I said, the last time we did this program with Twain, it was certainly uh, a, a reverent moment for everybody in the room. So thank you for, for bringing that to the book as well, just to honor all of those people that were lost, that survived, and that still remember that. Um, yeah. So it would have been a, a terrible thing to uh, endure. You know, fire was always the bane of the circus uh, from the very beginning, and uh, this was the worst uh, yeah. example of all. Uh, of all. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting. I'll just jump. Somebody um, in the the questions actually asked a little bit about James Bailey. I think that you did a wonderful job. It, people don't really talk about um, Bailey as much as as one would think. And you did a really nice job. It was le quite a number of pieces that um, I was like, oh, geez, I didn't realize that. So if you want to talk a little bit about Mr. Bailey, that would be fantastic because he's always overshadowed by by Barton. Yeah. He, he carries on the theme of uh, the characters uh, involved in the circus being almost as interesting as the circus. You know, <laughs> uh, he couldn't have, he uh, and Barnum teamed up uh, in the circus in the 1880s. And when Barnum was 70 years old and uh, Barnum in fact had nothing, as you know better than I, Barnum's uh, path didn't really cross with the circus until he was 60. He, was, uh, he came out of retirement as he often said, to yeah. get involved in, and then became one of the greatest of all uh, the uh, circus impresarios. Anyway, uh, uh, Barnum and, and Bailey couldn't have been much more different in personality and in expertise. And, you know, Barnum was a showman, uh, a PR wizard, par excellence, uh, and uh, could get people to come and watch a flea circus, really. And, uh, <laughs> But I, I'm not sure if he were asked to get from uh, New York back to Connecticut, he was going to need help. Bailey, on the other hand, knew the details of transport, the train schedules, was a management expert and uh, understood all the little details of how what it took to move this vast enterprise around the country and so forth. And one of the ironies of Barnum and Bailey is that there really is no such person as Bailey. That name is a fiction. It was a fabrication. Bailey was one of those young lads who ran away at an early age, in essence, to join the circus. He, No one knew in his family or his friends what had become of him. He disappeared one day after a trip to a swimming hole uh, at a nearby river. And for all his parents knew, uh, his well, his parents were dead, but for all his adopted, uh, his, uh, his uh, sister, who was in uh, taking charge of the raising of him and abusive, very abusive from one of the reasons he took off. As far as they knew, he had drowned swimming. That's what everybody thought, that Bailey was gone until many, many years later as a successful circusman, the show returned to his hometown and he sent an a, a invitation to his brother saying, you know, you were always all right. Why don't you come and meet me at my enterprise, the circus? Well. Uh, so that's that's Bailey uh, for you, uh, sort of a dyspeptic but extremely able guy who, like Barnum, and as different as he was, none uh, the less devoted his life to this crazy, uh, wild, uh, diversely challenging enterprise called the circus. Uh, uh, quite a Quite a story, if you ask me. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So thank you to Tammy, I think it was, uh, Tr Tammy, who asked that question. Um, yeah, he definitely deserves um, more of a voice in the history than certainly we even uh, give him at this point. So, so you know, you even mentioned that Barnum, yeah, it, the circus was his retirement project. But what um, a lot of folks don't know is that he was already a brand. It was his American Museum in lower, you know, Manhattan, you know, that really established Barnum um, that people knew. And when his second museum burned down, we're talking too much about fires, um, it was his friend Horace Greeley that said, take this as a sign and go efficient. <laughs> and that's when he went out west and met up with the, the circus um, promoters, Coop, Costello, to say, we, we could use your name. Let's run this enterprise. And Barnum actually says that it was uh, going to revive his love of his museums. So he's been in the museum business since 1842 to today. <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting. And um, he did see Bailey as having steel of his own. He uses that. And I think that was always so interesting that he really saw that Bailey had what it took. And they don't share the name. You don't see Barnum and Bailey, greatest show on earth, until three years before Barnum dies, um, which is incredible. And then Bailey took the, the Barnum and Bailey, greatest show on earth, on with them. And that's when the ringlings, you could talk a little bit about the ringlings, um, were so young at that point. It was not as big a show as the Barnum and Bailey was well, at that time. To me, just as incredibly, there were seven ringling brothers involved and all of them involved in the, in the circus ultimately. Uh, just five at first. Uh, one was too young at two and the other uh, stayed uh, working in his father's uh, harness shop. But uh, they went to see a circus, uh, a, sh a circus travel on a showboat uh, down the Missouri and the Mississippi, came to their hometown. They were so enthralled, they, uh, as a lot of kids do, said, let's put on a show of our own. Only they really meant it, these ringlings. And they erected a tent. They got the family pony and the goat. John played a clown. Uh, the, the older brother could do a few acrobatic tricks and they charged friends and neighbors five cents to come to this thing, made $13 on their run and said, there's something in this. And from that unlikely beginning grew an honest, they kept at it, grew an honest to God circus troupe that 25 years later had become un unbelievably the chief rival to Barnum and Bailey's greatest mm -hmm. show on earth. Uh, so much so that mm -hmm. Bailey said, you know what, I'm going to take my act to Europe for five years, and which mm -hmm. he did, and more or less left uh, the uh, the battleground open to the ringlings. And that's that's during the during that time, the, the ringlings grabbed uh, firm control of the industry uh, in the United States. And, led uh, uh, Barnum having died in 1891, uh, uh, Bailey uh, followed uh, 1906, I think the, the date is, and then uh, John Ringling engineered the merger of the two institutions. Right, right. Uh, until they combine them. It's another thing people don't realize, Barnum was dead for 28 years mm -hmm. before the first time you see Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey. And I always tell my friends with love, Barnum never would have taken second billing. <laughs> <laughs> no, he wouldn't. Never, it. never, never, he never. But, but, um, you know, t if you could talk to a little bit about the merger, I think that that's a really critical point, not just in circus history, but just in global history of what was happening. Um, by the time you're getting into the 1917, 1919. Well, the two entities merged, I say, in 1907. Began and they, right. uh, and they, uh, they continued to travel separately, each one of them with about a thousand uh, uh, individuals, uh, 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 workers and, and talent, and uh, traveling by train and carefully choreographed to avoid competition, although they could play the same venue twice uh, uh, a few months after the other and, and make double the money that way. But 
the World War II yeah. intervened and took away, all of a sudden, there were, I think there were nearly 400, nearly 400 men involved in tending to the livestock and particularly the horses. Well, in World War II, the Cavalry Corps was still operational. Most of those people were called up and called away to war. And so where there were once 400 people taking care of the horses, they were trying to make do with 100. Most of those were 4Fs, people really not physically capable of doing. Long story short, a couple with the Spanish flu, which we heard so much yeah. about in comparison to the worst flu, worst previous flu from COVID was the Spanish flu in 1919 decimated the workforce, uh, cut into the uh, audiences. People weren't going out, same uh, same way as, as now. And Ringling made the decision at that point, this is crazy, we're going to combine the shows from here on out. And, and they did. Uh, yeah, became they, the combined shows from that they, point. And you think about it, 100 years later, they're creating a bubble. You know, just like today, everything that we're doing, they're creating the bubble. And if all of that isn't enough, they're on the heels of the Dep Great Depression. Surprisingly enough, though, in 1929, uh, the Depression are already uh, uh, already in, in full bloom. Ringling uh, netted. Net profit was close to, in today's dollars, close to $200 million dollars for the circus enterprise uh, imagine now he would die uh, uh, eight years later with three hundred and eleven dollars uh, in the bank uh, due to a lot of infighting that, that took place in the family uh, after that. but he that's the height to which the circus and the economic impact that the circus had really uh, amazing it, it speaks to the need. It speaks to the, the the need, the desire that people had to, you know, find some bit of joy. And they could find, and the circus was accessible. I, you know, I, I think in the, in the end, and, uh, you know, social commentators, some social commentators have said to dismiss the uh, circus as mere entertainment or the pastime of a bygone age when people uh, uh, abused animals and so forth. That's very short-sighted ahistorical thinking that we're prone to do a lot of in this this day and age. The the truth is that the the American circus really reflected the American experience. When people, as Hamlin Garland uh, wrote about uh, in Boy Life on the Prairie in 1899. He talked about to work all day in the fields and uh, to the uh, point of exhaustion. And when the circus came to town, to walk into that tent and see all this these splendors pouring in and parading before your eyes was like uh, a little bit of heaven itself. It says it was the very apotheosis of possibility of the why people came to America in the first place, where anything could happen. Well. Uh, those who came to the circus and spent three or four hours got a first-hand demonstration of anything is possible. It yeah. was all, uh, unlike movies of today, special effects and screen, yeah. every amazing impossible thing that happened in the circus is real. It was human beings doing uh, yeah. those things. And how can that not be inspiring, and particularly to young people? Yeah. Yes, I, I mean everything. The the act of absolute perfection of the human body, you know, pushing pushing, you know, the physical ability to its furthest limits. The live music, the smells. I mean, there's nothing else like it, um, you know. And it and it it goes on. But to your point, too, when I was reading the book, and I like I said, I was able to re you know resonate on on it again. And what I realized, um, thinking about Battle for the Big Top. You know, I automatically went, my head automatically went to it being a battle between Sells and Barnum and, you know, the, the Ringling shows. And it's not. Um, it's a, the circus's battle with time and how the world changes. And now for a hundred, you know, it, it's still ongoing. You know, there's always a push and pull, a struggle based on a relevant moment at any given time period in history and even today. Um, and I thought that was really intriguing 
that uh, that it's not necessarily between actual entities, but it's the circus itself and how it has transformed as need be to continue on in not just even American uh, culture, but certainly global culture. There are there are circuses happening all over the planet right now, and it's and it's wonderful. But um, I thought that was very it, it was an aha moment for me. Time marches on, you know. Yes, it's it's true. I uh, the the personal focus there is on Bailey, and you know then bring in Bar Barnum, they become partners, and then Barnum and Bailey are up against Ringling and Ringling yes. prevail, but even the Ringlings couldn't beat Father Time and progress, and uh, they had to accept that. Interestingly enough, though, I think that when the Feld family bought uh, the, the combined shows in 1957, or in, 19, in the 1960s, took over operations from the uh, Ringling heirs, uh, fully, it was something of a, a shadow of itself for the, the 50 years that the Felds uh, ran it. But they ran it and they made a profit. And if they had, they wouldn't have, would not. And they came to love the the circus too. They they sort of, I think, as most of the other circus men, Barnum and Bailey and Ringlings included, saw themselves as sort of servants to something larger than themselves, they understood the importance of this, and and the thrills that people got meant something to uh, uh, them. Barnum never was was not for a moment the kind of guy who uttered that supposed quote often attributed to him. There's a sucker born every minute. He was not at all cynical in in that way. That was a dispirited competitor who was angry that he was such a good. PR man that they were going to see Barnum's oh. uh, uh, phony uh, stone card of giant instead of his. <laughs> He's the guy who said, "There's a sucker born every yeah. minute." <laughs> David David Hannum, you know, yeah. and he was outbeat. He was outbeat by the master. <laughs> so, those were David Hannum, uh, sore loser. Uh, uh, Barnum was a guy who loved giving people entertainment. His view was. Wait a minute! If people came and they enjoyed themselves and they didn't complain and they thought they had gotten their uh, money's worth of of entertainment, that's what's important. That's what's important. Anyway, the Felds were doing that too, and Irving Feld came out on that final night there uh, in in Nassau or on in the Coliseum and said, uh, uh, "You know, we we carried on for fifty years or almost fifty years until 2015, and then." bowing to the pressure uh, from uh, animal uh, advocates, we just decided we had to let the elephants go and they sent them out to pasture. And uh, that was 2015. And he said that at that moment, attendance mm -hmm. fell off a cliff. It became apparent to him and everyone in the organization that without the elephants, there could be no circuits. And that, mm -hmm. that really was uh, pretty much the end of that enterprise. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, it, it and was the sadness. You know, he's out there arrayed with the whole family, the kids, the grandkids. It looked like a small uh, graduating class of a small high school out there, seventy or eighty people, uh, with tears in their eyes, sad that uh, that this was going to that this was coming to an end. Yeah. I'm a firm believer that in some shape or some form, something as large. Um, as that Ringling Show will emerge again. There are so many schools now with circus arts that that there is a hunger for it, um, and it will it will find its way for the next you know it, it will find its way to combat time. <laughs> Somebody asked me uh, earlier. I was talking uh, today to uh, someone. They said, "Well, is there anything that does uh, today for society what the circus used to do?" And I thought about it. I off the top of my head, I said, "I suppose." particularly for young people, athletic events. They they go and they see athletes uh, doing these incredible things and amazing things that inspire them. But the circus had way more than athletic uh, ability. You know, it had glamour. It had theater. It had uh, drama. It had music. And, uh, uh, and, it and it talked to, and it created this sense of, there's an exotic world out there somewhere, grander and more wonderful and more wide than the world that you inhabit 
go find it. Go find uh, it. Yeah. Yes. Don't, you don't get that at the Super Bowl. I'm sorry. No, 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 you don't. And I think the closest they're coming to is the, like these TV contest um, shows that are out there where incredible performers are able to come on for their little segment in front of Simon Cowell. And somebody, what was it said to me? It is, it, you know, a performer came out and they did something extraordinary. And Simon Cowell is like, I've never seen anything like that before. And somebody's like, well, you've never been to the circus. So <laughs> it was like, it was like, geez. Yeah, but every other act on the um, America's Got Talent comes straight Yeah, up. America's Got Talent, you know. But um, before we jump into questions, and, and before I invite Jen back uh, to join us for some Q&A, because I'm looking at some things coming in, um, just wondering, because when we talked about a week or so ago, you had not watched The Greatest Showman movie. And we've had some funny back and forth <laughs> since then. Did you watch it? I did watch it. You did. I was wondering because you were you were already writing the book when when that came out. And um, I, did, I didn't want to be influenced in any right. way by what somebody else might have already done, and I knew it was going to be very popular, and so I didn't watch it. You did. Yeah. And, and then when I did watch it, I said, "Why did I worry?" Uh, you know, there's almost no relationship whatsoever between uh, uh, the Bible reality and history. Or, <laughs> Phil, I'm not going to say it's not good entertainment, but it doesn't have anything to do very much to do with what we're talking about. Right, exactly. And and um, and what we did to um, to confront uh, the fiction versus the fact a few years ago, and we have a video of it up on our the Barnum Museum YouTube. I look forward it's, to that. Yeah, I, please. It's fiction if I had versus. Seen it before I wouldn't have worried. Exactly. Right, right. But it is fun. I mean, they didn't just get Barnum history wrong; they just got history wrong but um you know the real story behind the real story so that's always fun so um we are believe it or not and honestly we could go on i know we could go on and on <laughs> because we're just even barely touching on all my notes and highlights but um there are some some uh questions coming in so jen if you want to jump back on do I, I ever? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, I have been riveted. Um, this has been so fascinating. So thank you um, both so much for sharing all your knowledge and enthusiasm. Um, I, it has gone by so quickly. And before we turn to any questions, I want to just uh, point out, somebody asked about how are Bailey and Barnum connected to Mark Twain? Well, Barnum and Twain were friends and corresponded uh, uh, quite a bit. And um, I think regarded each other very highly. And we're kind of both we're kind of the most famous man in America uh, at, at the same time. Am I right, Kathy, in, in saying that? Oh, yeah. There are some very fun, to be a fly on the wall with the two of them in a room and throw, you know, Harry Beecher Stowe in there. Right, right. <laughs> to have a pen and a piece of paper. But uh, what, uh, Les, I think that you even said that there's a distant connection between um, John Ringling and Sam Clemens, if I recall that in the book, that there was a distant. Did I read that right? Yes. Uh, the we we'll have to look at the book uh, to see what I said. Uh, I've got it confused. Uh, now with what I was just thinking about Twain's one of the I think one of the funniest passages in uh, Twain in Tom Sawyer is when Twain describes the circus act where you think a drunk has wandered into the ring to disrupt the horse uh, the equestrian act. And finally, the ringmaster once uh, figures out the way he'll get rid of this drunk is to say, oh, you think you can do this? Well, then just go ahead and try. And this drunk stumbles around and falls off the horse and looks like he's going to get himself killed until finally he's on top of the horse, riding the horse, standing on the horse bareback, shedding articles of his clothing <laughs> as he goes. And to you realize, of course, there's no, uh, this is no drunk at all, but but one of the performers, and uh, Twain had witnessed uh, this himself, mm -hmm. did, not, did not make it up, and was of the, the same opinion as Dr. Johnson in England, that the circus present the amazing capability of, uh, of human, uh, uh, that 
the the heights to which humans could rise physically was deserving of admiration and and praise and of course twain treated it uh comically and it's one of the great passages i think uh, i reread it several times to the point where i included a big chunk of it in uh, in the book and uh, uh twain was a a fan of the of the circus uh of barnum and i think appreciated barnum uh because of his, his the nature of his personality where john ringling was an astute businessman more along the uh, lines of, of of bailey although more pleasant more worldly more urbane uh that uh, that twain appreciated his his wisdom uh you know the, the circus was right up mark twain's alley Oh, that, absolutely. Yeah. The kind of thing that he, he loved and he loved about America. I think it was good humor and fun, but it also meant something. I would agree. And thank you for making mm -hmm. that connection for our, our uh, audience, um, particularly. Um, and I'm going to indulge host privilege and just make one more comment before we go the, to the good audience questions. Mm -hmm. So people might not know that there's another um, connection between Hartford and this whole story. Um, Chick Austin was the legendary director of our Wadsworth Muse Athenaeum Art Museum um, from 1927 to 1944. And then his next job after uh, being at the Athenaeum was to be the first director of the Ringling Museum in Sarasota. So, oh, no kidding. Yeah. Well, there was a reason why he got that job. Yeah. Uh, apparently, the governor invited him to be. Oh, was he? What was the reason? No, they just knew of, of his of his experience, and that's why I got that job. I get cut out of the uh, Barnum mold. Everybody tells me that Chick was one of these people that just drew everybody to him. That's absolutely correct. So that's that's a fascinating side story. There are so many fascinating side stories. So Kathy, do you yeah. want me to go to the questions, or uh, do you want to? Um, do you want so to? A couple of them are long, and I was just reading this one. Um, so let me let me read this next, and maybe you could cue it up, Jen, for the next question. Okay. Um, so I'm reading from Tom, and I'll and I'll read this. Um, I would love to hear your takes on contemporary circus, which often ignores the history of circus as an American tradition. Do you see companies like um, Cirque du Soleil and such as circus, or do you see them more as a kind of acrobatic theater? Do you see them as distinct? I'm curious what the criteria you have in mind that helps make the distinction. That's a good question. Well, Cirque du Soleil sort of has uh, broken the bounds of the, of the traditional, uh, the, the uh, it's not a proscenium arch uh, under the big top, but the bounds are very clear. There's uh, a ring or multiple rings it's bounded on all sides by uh, stands and a canvas. And everything that happens, happens within those bounds. Just like when you go to the theater and the curtain sweeps back, everything is sort of bounded within that very clear arch. And that's a limitation at the same time though, that's what leads an artist to figure out ways to transcend the sense that you're sitting outside sort of looking through a window and so they learn to do things that make you believe that you're actually on the stage and where Cirque du Soleil uh, well they can go as far up uh, into the flies uh, you know as they want the, the shows I've seen in Las Vegas uh, they're up there 150 feet uh, or more the the lighting the choreography the costuming the computer effects that they they use it's not that those people aren't physically on the wires aren't doing those things and taking some of the same risks but uh, the questioner is accurate in that it's a much reduced version of the circus whereas in the traditional circus as i was saying before it had a little bit of everything broadway drama and spectacle athleticism exotic animals uh and uh even pageants and 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 dramatic presentations that Cirque du Soleil does what it does very well they can't have animals anymore for the reasons that we've touched touched upon but and it's an impressive performance but <laughs> 
there is there is nothing, uh, and I'm not sure there ever can be uh, anything like the traditional circus again because of the diversity of those elements and all of it contained right there before your eyes uh, uh, to you know the point of trying to switch back and forth between things going on in three uh, rings at, and above the rings at once created a kind of sensory uh, overload almost a psychedelic experience that's, that's, yeah. I don't know where that where that happens uh, that kind of thing happens today if, if it does no one's taken me there so, so this is an interesting, sorry, I just told you to cue it up, Jennifer, but this is an interesting follow-up to that. Yeah. Um, Herb actually asks, besides the improvements in technology, would the founders recognize, and I'm, I'm assuming the founders, and I hope I'm correct in assuming uh, the founders being a, I mean, circus has been around for thousands of years, but a Barnum and Bailey Ringlings and such, would the founders recognize a common formula in acts, et cetera, in modern day circuses. Um, there are circuses in Germany that are doing things very tech based um, with augmented virtual reality on the platforms, no animals. So bring in, you know, image mapping. But I thought that, I think that's kind of an interesting uh, question. How would, how would the, the old guard really look and innovate maybe? what circuses should be moving forward? I'm not sure uh, what uh, Barnum would think, but I'm certain of one thing, he would adapt. He would be, oh, we can't have elephants anymore? All right, let's see, Let, show me your computers. Uh, oh, I'll, figure out, I'll figure out a way. Uh, that, was, that was the kind of person he was. And you know, I, I think that's, that's the uh, attitude that everyone who cares about the show, uh, you know, that old adage we talked about uh, earlier this week, the show must go on. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the utterance of a person who understands that they're not the important thing, that a performer is not the important, any individual performer is not the important thing. It's the show because mm -hmm. the show is going out, it's being presented for an audience and that matters more than anything else. That's kind of a wonderful selfless, about as uncynical an attitude as I can possibly think of. Yeah, it's absolutely, it's absolutely true it, because it is big. Every, every aspect of that show relies on the next aspect. It, it's, 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 it's mathematics. If you don't have this person, there's going to be trouble setting up the next, you know, the next element that needs to go on the act. So it is is such an ecosystem. Oh, and that's I think the clowns, we haven't talked about the clowns. The clowns, get, uh, yeah. you know, they, they don't get any respect, uh, but they are so important. Uh, the clowns, they the fill pegs. up the dead time. Yes, and the kids uh, like them. Yes, but the, the clowns are kind of the real bridge between the audience uh, and these people who can do all these impossible things. The clowns themselves, some they, they pretend to be amazed, but then turn around and repeat, replicate some of the uh, amazing uh, feats, just like that story I was telling you from Twain. And that pulls the audience into it. It makes them feel like, oh yeah, he's just like uh, that Emmett Kelly. He's just like I am. Yeah. He has a lousy job, he hates his boss, but he finds a way to turn the tables on his boss and make him look like a fool and uh, without being fired. Uh, you know, those uh, that a skit like that could go on. That whole story could be told in a minute and a half, in mind, with no words spoken. Uh, uh, there in the in the 30s and the 40s, uh, early 50s, uh, Kelly's heyday. Uh, uh, people, you know, I think clowns don't get enough press. So let's give them a huge shout out right now. I know <laughs> they get a huge shout out right now. And I know a few. <laughs> everything you just said is absolutely true. Oh. So I salute Peggy and Ruth and <laughs> Alex. Right on. Right on. So, and then um, Bruce Johnson just sent, he sent in a lovely quote that I'll share too on the Carson Barnes Circus. 
uh, we said, cause he was part of that. Um, we said we were a town that had a different piece of real estate under, uh, real estate under it every single day. And they yeah. did, they really did. Cause they moved. So yeah. that that's, yeah. Like yeah. So I, I'm sorry, I didn't get it out very eloquently, but there it is. But uh, Jen, I'm just looking at it. It's exactly eight o'clock. Um, there, Dick Flint had a couple of pieces there. The, the, you said the live chat, the chat is going to be live for a while. So maybe some questions could get answered afterwards. I was going to just ask that because we do have some questions. And yes, if either of you would be kind enough, the, the, we'll be posting this on our website and the, the chat stays live forever. So, um, you know, if you were able to come back and address some of these questions we weren't able to get to, um, that would be awesome uh, and oh. very generous of you. Fantastic. And Fred Fenning just came in with an answer about um, uh, about Bailey. So thanks, Fred. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. <laughs> I'd just like to know what's the modern equivalent of running away to join the circus? Running away to join a museum. I mean, really? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we got we got to keep this get this story going forever. That's that is a good one. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what kept me going in Cambridge, Ohio. I could always run away and join the circus. There you go. <laughs> well, my gosh, um, what a what a treat to spend the evening talking with the two of you. And so, thank you so much for your. Um, as I said, your insights and knowledge, and also just for being fun to, to listen to. Um, and um, thank you to our audience for your active participation and your good questions. And um, thank you to our sponsors and to everybody who purchased the book, which if you have not decided yet that you need this book, uh, I would imagine you need it now. So I'm gonna, before I close, I'm gonna repost the link um, so it's easy for you to find. And does either of you have anything you want to say at the, in conclusion? I, I want to thank everybody watching, of course, absolutely. And Les, it's just been a joy to get to know you. I'm looking forward to seeing you at the Circus Historical Society uh, conference that's coming up this fall. Plug out to all the, the friends there. He's going to do an actual in-person presentation. So isn't that exciting? I, I feel <laughs> the same way, uh, Kathy. It's not, you know, uh, so easy to make friends, uh, you know, the older you get. And I feel like I've been more. <laughs> but uh, the last thing I will say is who, what a joy it's been to work on this project. Who else gets to sit at their desk uh, day after day and feel like they're making a living writing about the bearded lady and the elephants? I mean, come on. <laughs> Gee, it's as if I ran away. <laughs> I mean, it's not like working in a museum or anything. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, I do think you promised us to come visit us uh, at Mark Twain's house when you're here in September. I look forward so, to it, yeah. And we're hoping Kathy can join too. So let's yes, work on that. And we were promised Twain bobbleheads, and I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> okay. I'll bring the popcorn. Okay, very good. Oh my gosh, what a great evening. Thank you both so much. And thank you again to our audience. And um, thanks for your generous donations as well. We'll see you next time. And everybody have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.